Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Paris. Bienvenue à Paris for the fifth edition of the European Mentoring Summit. We have heard so much about Paris being the capital for the Olympic Games, but let me tell you that this week, Paris will be the capital for mentoring. Paris is 20, this is our Paris 2024. <laughs> My name is Fiona, and together with Hisbert, we'll be your hosts. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today. We see many familiar faces, also new faces. Yes, indeed. We are 300 people here at the Sorbonne University, 23 different countries represented. And I think that Germany is the largest number of attendees, followed by the Netherlands and by Spain. Of course, France, but... <laughs> We have also some courageous ones that came on their own. We have people from Israel, Finland, Korea, and Egypt. And we also have some of them that came all the way from very far, like New Caledonia, US, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, like very international. South Korea. Yeah, Korea, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is why the event will be mostly moderated in English, but you have some translation devices ready for you. And for the next speakers, some of them will be speaking in French. So we will ask you to play a bit with the, with the translation devices. I know that channel five is for French and channel six is for English. So we have more than 60 hours of content. We have workshops, masterclasses, and of course the plenaries. And to help you navigate it, we have the Imagina app. You can download it in the Google Play Store or in the Apple Store. And if you need help setting it up, you can go to the uh, backstage or uh, the, the volunteers are there to help you set it up. So what can you do in the Imagina M? You can discover the content, you can uh, connect and chat with other participants, ask questions during the Q&A. So all the questions will go through the app. If you scroll down, you see interact. Um, uh, and speaking of interacting. Yeah, you have yeah, a question, I think. I have a question for you all. So let's try this out. Uh, if you have set up your uh, Imagina app already, please pick your phone. We're, we're okay. not the only one working <laughs> here. <laughs> no no network. network. For those who don't have a network, you have a badge. And if you return your badge, turn it, you will see on the bottom of your badge, of your tag, you will see a Wi-Fi code with a password and uh, the network you have to log in. So, like in mentoring, <laughs> sometimes you have to improvise because you never know what to... Uh, what to uh, Indeed. We want to know, the question we want to know is, in one word, what do you expect from this summit? So, let's just start thinking about it and uh, you could share it later on with us, with participants and with the app itself. Um, let's follow, right? Yeah. Let's follow. And to follow, let's have some introductions and open this summit. Let's hear a word from the organizations that made this summit possible. Please, a warm welcome for Christophe, Erika, Sylvia. Please join the stage. Yes. Bonjour à, à toutes et à tous. Je, je vous souhaite... Euh à toutes, à tous, euh, au nom de l'ensemble du collectif Montora, la bienvenue à Paris. Welcome to Paris. J'ai toujours <rire> rêvé de dire cette phrase. Vous ne pouvez pas savoir comment je suis euh, heureux et ému euh, d'ouvrir cette euh, séance, ce, ce mythe de, de trois jours. Je vais dire quelques mots très rapidement parce que les deux vrais discours, c'est Sylvia et Erika qui, qui vont les, les donner pour donner le, le ton de ce, ce mythe. Mais je voulais euh, voilà, vous dire... Quelques mots très rapidement. Il y a six ans, en 2018, nous étions invités par Sylvia à Berlin pour le deuxième summit européen du mentorat. Les associations françaises étaient peu présentes dans cette formidable dynamique européenne qui se développait et que nous découvrions. Nous avions en France beaucoup d'actions, mais pas forcément réunies sous ce vocable de mentorat social, chacun utilisant son propre terme. Il y a une expression connue en France, 
issu d'une pièce de théâtre de, de Molière, le bourgeois gentilhomme, qui dit, euh, comme M. Jourdain qui faisait de la prose sans le savoir, nous faisions du mentorat euh, sans vraiment euh, en avoir tous euh, conscience. Et depuis, nous avons rejoint pleinement cette dynamique de mentorat européen, créé en France, avec euh, le ministère de la Jeunesse qui, qui est ici représenté, euh, créé en France un collectif, le collectif mentorat, construit avec l'État français une politique très ambitieuse de généralisation du mentorat, un jeune à mentor. Je suis euh, si heureux et aussi euh, un peu fier au nom de, de toutes les associations du collectif mentorat de vous accueillir euh, à notre tour pour continuer à faire grandir ensemble ce mouvement, ce mentorat si essentiel dans ce double défi euh, de lutte contre les inégalités de parcours et de création de, de liens sociaux. Alors, plaçons euh, ce summit sous le slogan euh, des Jeux Olympiques 2024, mais, mais le, le slogan français, pas le slogan, le slogan anglais, pas le slogan français. Le slogan français, c'est euh, euh, ouvrez grand euh, les, les Jeux. Le slogan anglais me semble plus approprié au summit du mentorat puisque c'est Made for Sharing. Et je vous souhaite un excellent cinquième summit européen du mentorat. Sylvia, je suis très heureux de te laisser le micro. I take it that these were very kind and positive words about us. Yeah. I didn't have my translation. Thanks, Crystal. Right? All positive? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> okay. Dear all, so good to see you guys all. Wonderful. It's like a family getting together again, a reunion. An honor to welcome you at the fifth edition of the European Mentoring Summit and the eighth anniversary of Mentoring Europe, our mentoring community. As you guys know, we are a community across borders to learn, to shape, to share, and to innovate together in mentoring, to collaborate in research, to support each other in keeping ambitions, energy, and drive. As you know, the summit is a traveling event, right? every second year in a different, men different mentoring hub in Europe. And this year we are in Paris to seek inspiration from the French mentoring scene, which is rich in traditions and long in traditions and very high in ambitions. So much happened in the last uh, two years since the last summit. The Germans launched a national network. The Irish are matching mentees from higher education. A Dutch program celebrated its 25th year's anniversary. A Czech research group uh, developed knowledge on natural mentoring in secondary schools. The Romanians are introducing mentoring as a major tool to prevent bullying. In the Basque country, companies and mentoring providers created re recommendations for the SDGs and mentoring. And in Spain, public institutions acknowledged the national quality seal. Big deal. So. Just a few examples from north, south, east, west. Furthermore, our common voice led us to two major events in the European Parliament focusing on mentoring. And the Committee of the Regions published an opinion piece titled Mentoring, a powerful, meaningful tool for the Europe of tomorrow. What can we wish for more? Some of you say to me, Sylvia, it's happening. We don't have to keep explaining anymore. People are coming to us, asking to do more mentoring together. Others say to me, it's so new in our city what we do, nobody understands us. So that is why this summit is so important, to give each other ideas on how to improve and grow, or even how to survive, so that we support mentors and mentees in reaching the impact they choose for. And What is coming our way in the coming period? First of all, as I'm sure you guys notice, governments are increasingly interested in mentoring, so let's keep shouting out. It will lead to new policies. Let's especially watch educational policy as that will bring us opportunities in connecting formal and informal mentoring. Multinationals and industry wants to invest in mentoring increasingly as a way of civic engagement and as a way of workforce development because they see it happening globally. This can give us a boost in regions, especially where mentoring is less known. We also see that EU authorities encourage us to apply for more European collaborations and funding. So all, all in all, 
many opportunities coming our way. I'm sure coming days, even more opportunities will, be, will be discovered and occur. I want to end with a quote of our founder and my mentor, Betty Byfoot. Mentoring touches eternity. You never know when the impact ends. I wish you much inspiration and fun in the coming days. Enjoy, recharge, get curious and connect. Thank you. Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome indeed uh, today in Paris. I hope you enjoy uh, your journey. Thank you to be here during three days together. We share the same goal every day. We help thousands of beneficiaries all over Europe every day. And uh, we help them to get a better life through education and employment. They are young inhabitants from disadvantaged areas, isolated, without networks. They are old, without employment nor up updated skills. And they are prevented from succeeding, but they are motivated to succeed. Our mission is to help them to get through mentoring success in their life and to get a better life. We know them with our teams. Every day we met them. We know their towns. We know their disadvantaged area. We know their journey. We know their difficulties. We know their families. We know their stories. And we all along the years experimented, measured that mentoring is a successful tool for our beneficiaries to succeed. Therefore, it has been obvious to propose you all your parent countries, so 23 countries uh, during three days, to deploy our practices, our mentoring, so that more and more beneficiaries succeed and so that our country in Europe are more inclusive societies and that Europe is more inclusive. And this is even more critical politically nowadays for peace and cohesion. But we deeply know that this transformation is not happening like that. And that we need to spread mentoring with quality, with high detail processes and measurement. This is the reason why we define the theme of our, of our three days summit, expanding reach, deepening impact, mentoring for facing challenges and empowering futures. Let's share our best practice among all European countries and with our American friends. And let's invent new practices. Let's design together the future of mentoring in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I have another big round of applause? <laughs> so it's my honor to introduce our first keynote speaker. Um, can I get another big applause for Grace Gaudi? Please, Grace. So. Grace Gaudi is a senior researcher for the Youth, Family and Community Division of the Education Northwest. And she is most passionate about uh, improving the lives of young people through mentoring. So Grace, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Grace Gaudi. I'm a senior researcher at Education Northwest. We all know that if you speak two languages, you are called bilingual. If you speak three languages, you are called trilingual. But if you speak only one language, you are called American. <laughs> so thank you for inviting me to speak, despite that deficit. Look at you. You're at the European Mentoring Summit. That's very exciting. Congratulations. How did you hear about it? How did you get here? How did you find the resources, the childcare, the time of day? How did you make it here? I'll go first. 
Uh, about 10 years ago, I started my PhD program at Boston University. And with many PhD programs, they paired me with a formal mentor to guide me through that process. My formal mentor is Renee Spencer, who is here and did not know her face was gonna pop up on the screen. <laughs> My apologies. And for the next several years, she guided me through emotional support, instrumental support, good advice, got me through my dissertation period. She also did a couple of other things for me. She introduced me to the National Mentoring Resource Center, which is a great uh, OJJDP funded resource center for practitioners, policymakers, and researchers alike. That introduced me to a ton of other great researchers, including Tom Cavell and uh, Tom Keller and Tim Cavell. Their names sound very familiar. Uh, that is supported by Mentor, which is a national US-based organization that supports youth mentoring, who introduced me to Mike Geringer. A couple years ago, Mike Geringer started talking to me about good places that might be a fit for me to work, places that ooh, match my ideas, and uh, places that would be very supportive, which is how I got my current job at Education Northwest. He also introduced me to Fiona, which got me here in front of you all today. So it is true that Renee is a fantastic mentor. But if you were to look at just that dyadic relationship, you'd be missing the bigger story about how she has influenced my life. And this is true for our young people as well. There is so much more to youth mentoring than that dyadic relationship that we spend, tend to spend so much time thinking about. We all know that strong relationships provide a network of caring adults that uh, help young people thrive. That feels like a very basic value set that we probably all share. And a formal mentor, that big brother, big sister type mentor, is just one example of who that caring adult can be. So employing a social capital perspective, which is what I'm going to talk about today, helps us zoom out and consider the entire social world that that young person is a part of. For those of us who are not French, we may need a small primer on what social capital is. Uh, Pierre Bordeaux coined the term social capital along with economic and cultural capital to explain differences in achievement that aren't necessarily based on skills or intelligence. So maybe our young people were ending up where they were, not as a direct product of their skills or intelligence, but as a cumulative impact of who they know and the relationships that, uh, the resources that they have to offer. So for the purposes of today's talk, we're gonna talk about social capital as the total sum of resources that are available in your social world. And applying the social capital lens to your youth, youth mentoring calls us to do a couple of things. One, First, to acknowledge that our young people already exist in a social world. Then, to recognize the assets that are already a part of that social world. We then can invest in our young people by investing in the world around them and the relationships around them, ultimately creating a cumulative impact for mentoring. So let's take these one at a time. Again, we tend to spend a lot of our time thinking about the relationship between a formal mentor and their young person, or their mentor. But we know that they're a part of a much larger social world. They are a part of school communities and out of school time and really innumerable amount of other uh, contexts. This holistic view, this zoomed out view, uh, lets us acknowledge that it likely takes more than one person to create positive impacts for young people. It likely takes a whole constellation of helpful adults at certain times providing certain types of support. It also acknowledges that there is still a place for formal mentors. It is not as if if we zoom out and take in the social world, we think that they are covered and have the resources that they need. In fact, up to 38% of young people do not report a caring non-parental adult in their lives. You are less likely to report a caring non-parental adult if you don't live in a two-parent home, whose parents went to college, if you live in neighborhoods with higher rates of unemployment that aren't considered safe. So for formal mentors can serve as a compensatory resource here by joining the social world and providing that support. We have a couple of different tracks in the next couple of days. Uh, the first one is about enhancing relationships, dive into the depths and fostering inclusive and diverse relationships. It's interesting to think about how we can diversify both our mentors and our mentees by embracing the social world that we are uh, supplementing here. 
This zoomed out version, this holistic view of the social world, also lowers the relative power of the mentor. And formal mentors have traditionally held a lot of power. In the American context, our formal mentoring programs typically match minoritized and marginalized young people with someone who is often upper to middle class white educated women. So what are we telling young people by doing that? We are telling them that in order to make it and have positive outcomes, they need to know more white ladies, which usually isn't true. And formal mentors' impacts can often be overstated. We have a bunch of great meta-analyses out there now that say that formal mentoring tends to have small to medium impacts that are pretty short-lasting. So we give formal mentors a lot of power, and sometimes if we zoom in too much on that relationship, that power doesn't actually come to fruition in outcomes all that often. Importantly, a single relationship cannot make up for structural inequity. Our young people, particularly our minoritized and marginalized young people, are facing a very complicated system of oppressions, and it's not as if one mentor, silver bullet, can uh, save the day here. Rather, formal mentoring relationships should be thought of as just a single source of social capital in a larger world that, uh, filled with resources for the young people. The next thing that using a social capital perspective calls us to do is recognize the assets that are already in the young person's social world. We often view minoritized and marginalized young people's social world as impoverished, where in fact, uh, young people often tend to have kin or kin-like relationships that serve as sources of mentorship. So a core mentor is someone often from your extended family or your fictive kin who you've known for a really long time who provides emotional support and is linked to a decreased likelihood of depression and anxiety. So if we expand our definition of mentoring, we do see mentors in the lives of young people. There are lots of different theoretical models that help us consider what other assets are in young people's world. The one I wanna highlight here is the community cultural wealth model. It asks us what assets are already available to our young people and how can formal mentoring support and grow what is already there. It considers social capital in tandem with many other forms of capital that are available to young people, including familial capital, which is that uh, kin or kin-like relationship, resistance and aspirational capital, which are the ability to keep going in the face of systemic oppression and to continuously call for better and navigational capital, which is the ability to complicate, or ability to navigate complex systems without a role model in that space. Our young people have a whole lot going for them, and if we expand our view and ask what assets are already there, we can then use mentoring to support that. We then invest in our young people by investing in their social world. A young person's own investment in their social world is often measured by their participant in extracurricular activities. Are they a part of a religious community? Are they a part of after school programs, sports, things like that? But we don't consider how uh, these investments can be different for minoritized and marginalized young people. Particularly, we have pay to play norms. You need to purchase sports, uh, uniforms, things like that. We also don't consider young people's potential role as caregivers for family members or their potential as income generators for their families. So while we are thinking of their investment as their ability to participate in these things, that way of measuring it is biased in and of itself. Formal mentoring programs can support investments in social networks. We can consider how accessible our programs are for minoritized and otherwise marginalized youth. We also need school-based mentoring programs who can be intentional about connecting to other adults in the building, again, growing that social network. This is another track that I'm excited to learn alongside with you all in the next couple of days, and that is focused on growth strategies and innovations, including social mentoring, uh, youth-initiated mentoring, lots of good stuff on this agenda. We also wanna give our young people opportunity to meet network brokers. That term is from a more traditional social capital literature. 
um, more modern literature calls it capital mentors, which are mentors that are already embedded in powerful institutions. They can provide bridging capital to a young person by introducing them to resources they didn't already have access to. And formal mentors can play an important role in growing one's social capital by introducing them to these resources. Importantly, uh, we need to acknowledge that access to mentors is not equal. Minoritized and marginalized young people are likelier to be disciplined, be the recipients of microaggressions, and have other negative engagements when talking to these potential capital mentors. So on a school level, we need policies and practices that promote relationship-centered schools and bring in formal mentors at its a compensatory resource here. Again, there's lots of room for formal mentoring when zooming out and looking at all the social networks available to a young person. Lastly, if we do these things, we can create a cumulative impact for our young people. Social capital begets social capital, which just means give them a little and it'll grow and grow. Uh, they can be some real cumulative impacts of formal mentoring practices above and beyond how we typically think of it. So formal mentors can introduce mentees to new people, which expands their social world. They can also increase their network orientation, which just means their confidence and ability to expand their social world on their own. If I have a really good relationship with my big brother, I'm more likely to trust caring non-parental adults that I'm not already attached to and seek out uh, those relationships. Then the mentees become mentors. I think we're gonna hear about this a little more later. Uh, really creating this like intergenerational cumulative impact of, of youth mentoring. This track is about influencing systems, discussing the systemic and transformative impact of mentoring. Again, zooming out and considering this social capital perspective really opens us up to think about how we can create these big impacts. In the upward mobility literature, there's something called the multiplier effect, which means that privilege just leads to more privilege. Uh, young people who already have personal, family, community, societal level privileges are the ones who are more likely to report a rich social world. And formal mentoring really has the opportunity here to serve as that multiplier effect for all young people. This is the last tract that I uh, am very excited about. Shed light on strategies to maintain, measure, and improve the quality of mentoring relationships and programs. We were already a part of some conversations today about how thinking big and cumulatively quickly becomes a conversation about program and practice quality. So what if? What if we use social capital to embrace the social world that our young person is already a part of? We could take an expansive and plentiful view of the important resources available to young people and then consider how formal mentoring can supplement what's already there. Formal mentoring can be viewed as just one bridge connecting two people who might otherwise not be connected which gets us out of this superhero silver bullet narrative. We could examine mentors for what they are, one of many supports that should, we, should be equitably available to all young people. We could invest in policies and practices that seek to grow our young people's social world while still centering their own voice and choice in that matter. And we could frame formal mentoring as a way to expand the social world, creating these cumulative and longer lasting impacts. Thank you. Thank you very much, Grace. So, we have arrived at the Q&A with the app, but because not everybody has set up the app yet, we will have people walking around to answer, uh, uh, to ask your questions. So, uh, who would like to kick off? Who has a question for Grace? Grace, is your microphone on? Yes. Check, check. Okay. Not all at once, everyone. One moment, you have to, you get a microphone. You get oh. a microphone. A or a recommendation for formal mentoring programs? Yeah. A general recommendation for formal mentoring. Yeah, I think a pretty uh, solid place to start is by asking the young person about their social world. 
even when thinking about uh, recruiting, what type of mentor might be most helpful here, or as a mentor getting to know the young person. There are lots of great eco map activities out there where you can see who they already have connections to and then learn more about how to join up with the world. Thank you. Yeah. So can I ask questions as a moderator? Is that okay with the audience? Yeah, okay. So I'm also a practitioner and we make formal mentoring matches. What could be our first step to uh, support uh, youngsters in uh, building more natural networks? What, what would be, so we get back to the Netherlands and uh, we say, okay, we got inspired by Grace. What should we do? Yeah, I think as mentors, it would be nice if there were more questions about your relationships with your teachers. Yeah, let me give you another mic. Technique is failing us today. <laughs> so, yeah. Let it, yeah, please. How's this? Ooh, maybe this better. better, right? Okay, yeah. great. Uh, so, as mentors, we can ask more questions about teachers and other potential informal mentors that they already have. Um, mentors are able to provide bridging capital, which expands the social world by introducing you to new resources you didn't already have access to. But it also expands uh, bonding capital by creating better relationships with the informal adults you already have in your life, teachers and coaches and things like that. So mentors could ask more questions about that and support okay. those relationships. Thank you, we will do. And I see uh, that Fiona, do we have any questions through the app? Yes, we do. Uh, we have Nawel Kanari asking, could we have more info on the community cultural wealth model? Oh yes, it's a great model. Uh, so Yoso, Y-O-S-S-O, -S -S -O, uh, first wrote about it in 2005. She's a educational sociologist, I think. And it's really a, a wealth of resources out there. Thank you. Any more questions from the audience? I'm checking the app in the meantime. Another one. I go? Yeah. Um, Alex Grunewald, how to make mentoring cool for youth <laughs> so they wish to become a mentor themselves? How we create this impact? Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I think the best way, I don't know if you can make things cool to young people. That feels like a hard, <laughs> a hard ask. Uh, but you can... Um, show them the impact of their own mentoring relationship. So long-term mentoring is really good about that. Uh, talking to people about how they've benefited from their own mentoring relationship tends to create that desire to be a mentor themselves. Maybe I can add another one. Um, how we can also um, make mentees realize about the role models they can be and the models, the role models they already have around. Yeah, yeah. So this idea about increased network orientation, which means that because of your positive relationship with your formal mentor, you are more likely to seek out relationships with other adults. It also creates this self-awareness of mm -hmm. your own role in other people's networks as well. So really creating just relationship-centered spaces and conversations about rich networks uh, would promote that. Any more questions from the audience? I see a hand there. Yeah, you already have the microphone. Yeah, I have the microphone. Great. Hi, yes. Grace. Thank you very much for a great uh, keynote. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about what kind of qualities a good mentor needs, what kind of skills to be a good mentor. Mm -hmm. So speaking of broadening the social capital of the mentee, uh, wouldn't it be good to train the mentors on how to do that? And do you know of any best uh, practices in terms of training for broadening the social capital of the mentees? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Mentor, the US-based nonprofit that supports mentoring, has some great stuff called Mentor Mindset. Um, and what's the other one? Connect, grow, what? Become a better mentor, thank you. Uh, so there are good resources on Mentor's website about how to think of yourself as a mentor if you're in youth-rich spaces, like a teacher or something like that. Uh, lots of good stuff on Mentor's website. Looking yes. around. Yes, I'm, I'm here. Yeah. How to measure the impact of mentoring? How to measure the impact? That's a big question. <laughs> yeah, big, yeah, big question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, how to measure the impact on the social world? 
on the young adult and uh, on the on the social world yeah. and for the, to convince our partners to invest in mentoring yeah 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 so this is great i get to plug all of my favorite organizations here <laughs> uh, then the national mentoring resource center has a measurement guidance toolkit that's a lot of uh, words, but I, I can write it on a um, business card or something and give it to you. Uh, so they have a measurement guidance toolkit that has only um, three available sound measures of a whole bunch of qualities you might want to capture as a mentoring program, uh, including social support, things like that. And they're coming out with a social capital one too that will capture that broader social world so you can then track that change over time. That should be out in the next six weeks. So, and during the uh, the launches and the networking sessions, there will be a lot of opportunity to connect to. Also about this question. So, if you have this question, feel free to reach out to anyone from the uh, from the organization, and we will connect you to the uh, the right people. Yeah. yeah. So, Fiona, do we have any more questions through the app? No more questions from the audience. I see here a question. Do we have a microphone already. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, the mentors you're talking about, where do they come from? From companies or are they, where are The they? formal mentors? The yeah. Formal. I think a lot of um, this type of work can come from community-based mentoring programs. So those uh, big brother, big sister type programs that recruit from communities. I think a youth-initiated mentoring model would also be great in thinking about that larger social world. And then school-based mentoring is nice because that social world is sort of constrained to a building. So that school-based mentor can introduce you or talk to you more about the other adults that are already in that building. Uh, but the perspective can be applied to lots of different programs. Good question, thank you. Thank you. So I think we have uh, room hi, for two hi, more Gra questions. Hi, yeah. Hi, Grace. Uh, hi. Thank you for that uh, contribution. Highly interesting. It's, it's more a question, but also a statement. To what extent is the Bourdieu model and social capital looking at marginalized groups, for example, uh, only, only part of the narrative regarding mentoring? My, my, my concern or resistance to this model is that the, the mentoring narrative is written with marginalized groups. Have you done any research or looked at models that are, look at, are working with elites or, or let's say people that we deem having a good social capital already successful students, for example, in education. And that, that's part of the issue I have with, with some of the mentoring models in the UK. The narrative is written with a low bar. We're lowering the mentoring bar, looking at people in need rather than also looking at successful students and mentoring them to probably greater things. Sure. Just so I understand the concern, is it that the social capital perspective is focusing too much on minoritized and marginalized young people, and we haven't done work on like elite or more privileged groups? Yes, across a number of platforms. Research tends to be looking at Bourdieu's model, the effects of social capital, community, community of practice, for example, also, just to, to, to get that in by stealth there. So I'm just wondering if a lot of the research is about that. We're not researching the, the impact of mentoring on elite groups, successful groups, because yeah. they also have a contribution to mentoring. Sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point. So, um, you know, originally social capital was um, a new theory as to explain achievement outcomes, right? It's the culmination of your uh, resources that you already have in your relationships, which would then sort of um, implicitly suggest that more elite groups have this richer social world already, and then formal mentoring used supplementary in that way. I do think there's uh, benefits of mentoring to all groups. I think um, historically, mentoring has been sort of um, operationalized in like particularly as a supplementary resource in minoritized and marginalized communities. So I'd have to think through how it would apply to more elite groups who theoretically have a much richer social world already, much more resource social world. Thank you. Thanks for your question. Uh, one more question and then we have another uh Part for you. <laughs> Don't see any hands. Okay, can I get a big applause for Grace? Thank you for, for sharing your valuable insights. So, to illustrate what Grace has just shared with us, we have two youth voices, and they will be sharing their mentoring journeys. It also resonates 
very well with mentees becoming mentors. So can I get a big applause for Joost and Esme? <laughs> so Joost is uh, 19 years old and he's a student mentor from, uh, from uh, the Netherlands. And next to Joost is Esme and she's a young teacher, mentor, and also a mentee from the Netherlands. So uh, Joost, are you ready to share your story? Ready. Nice. This is yes. Thank you. Okay. Hello. I'm Joost. I'm a social work student, secondary vocational education. Um, being a mentee has had a big impact on me, providing valuable opportunity for professional growth within my field. Many young people miss is what we call confrontation with the real world, something I also lacked before uh, before joining the mentoring program. We refer it as a little push into the back. With all these experience as a mentee, I became a student mentor. As a mentee and a mentor, I developed a special set of tools. Now is the time to give back and give others a little push into the right direction. Thank you. Thank you, Joost. Thanks. <laughs> That's me. Yeah, I am uh, really excited to share my uh, journey with mentoring. Uh, growing up, I, like many other youngsters, uh, found it challenging to navigate decisions about my future, especially when it came to further education or entering the workforce. While my parents and friends, who have been role models my whole life, offered advice, I really craved unbiased guidance. It wasn't until I started to uh, work at the mentor program that I started to understand the power of having a mentor, mentor magic, as many of you name it. Witnessing the transformation in other mentees inspired me to seek guidance myself. Although opening up has been a hurdle, I'm determined to learn and to grow. And I hope the exchange of experiences during this summit encourages me and others to embrace this mentoring journey wholeheartedly. Thank you. Oh, thank you. so thank you very much for sharing stories. And if you have any questions for Joost and Esme, they will be here during the whole summit. So please feel free to reach out to them. Thank you. Fiona, well, thank you both. take the floor. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now that we have heard about uh, Grace's uh, story and youth story about the benefits of mentoring, how it allows us to create these networks of relationships, how we can have this multiplier effect and how it can, it can drive positive change within our communities and our youth, as Esme and Joost just told us. Now that we have all this information, let's have a warm welcome from, for three high-ranking representatives for the first panel discussion, where we will discuss how we can make mentoring a viable, inclusive, and structural public service. Please, Thibault, Christina, Stefan, join me. A big applause. Unfortunately, Anis Romero couldn't be here with us because her plane got canceled. So it's going to be the, the three of us. Thank you. Um, Thibault, I'm going to start with you. <laughs> You are the head of the Direction of Youth, Non-Formal Education and Voluntary Organizations called JEBVA in France, the agency supporting and operating together with Collectif Mentora, the national public policy One Youth, One Mentor. And I think we have a here very curious, a very curious audience about this, this plan. My question will be in French and my interaction with Thibault will be in French. So for those who need to play with the device, uh, you can change to your channel. Merci d'être ici avec nous. En quoi consiste le plan Un jeune à mentor et en quoi est-ce que c'est une première pour la jeunesse et pour le mentorat en France et j'ai envie de dire aussi dans le monde Merci. Bonjour à toutes et tous. Ravi d'être avec vous aujourd'hui sur ces enjeux qui, qui nous passionnent, nous aussi. Alors effectivement, la, la dynamique du, du mentorat, même si effectivement elle était présente en France auparavant, elle a connu une très forte accélération à partir des années 2020-2021 et en particulier sous l'impulsion du président de la République, Emmanuel Macron, 
qui est lui-même intervenu et a fait des déclarations euh, autour de cette politique du mentorat avec son souhait qu'il y ait justement une montée en charge du mentorat en France comme politique publique. Et donc c'est dans ce cadre-là que nous avons développé, en lien avec toutes les associations et le collectif mentorat, euh, la politique publique du mentorat euh, en France avec des objectifs chiffrés dès l'origine. Le président de la République parlait de 100 000 jeunes mentorés dès les premières années, avec une volonté d'augmenter les années suivantes. Et donc, une politique publique nouvelle qui s'ajoutait aux autres dispositifs que nous portons à la direction de la jeunesse et une politique, bien sûr, à destination des jeunes les plus éloignés, les plus défavorisés, et donc une brique dans l'agenda porté par le gouvernement pour l'égalité des chances dans notre pays. Alors, avant le, le lancement du plan Un jeune, un mentor, c'est comme ça que nous, nous l'appelons en France, on avait environ 30 000 jeunes qui bénéficiaient tous les ans de programmes de, de mentorat mis en œuvre par plusieurs, une diversité d'associations. La, ce à quoi a consisté le plan Un jeune, un mentor, c'est euh, une montée à l'échelle, une augmentation de l'ampleur euh, du mentorat euh, dans euh, notre péri. Et donc ce, ce passage à l'échelle, je le mentionnais, c'est une volonté de, de 100 000 jeunes dès la première année, 150 000 jeunes la suivante, et puis encore un peu plus euh, dans les années qui, qui ont suivi. Avec une forte mobilisation euh, de l'État, euh, importante depuis 4 ans et puis un budget de 30 millions d'euros par an euh, qui est dévolu euh, à la politique euh, publique. Et donc sur ces 30 millions d'euros, euh, ce que nous faisons depuis le département ministériel, c'est subventionner et accompagner les associations qui euh, portent sur les territoires euh, le mentorat. Et donc c'est une politique publique qu'on a construite et euh, menée en partenariat avec les associations et puis le, le collectif euh, mentorat, avec la volonté de faire un programme de mentorat euh, de haute euh, qualité. On avait euh, certaines associations qui faisaient euh, déjà du, du mentorat de manière euh, ancienne, hein, et Christophe Paris l'évoquait en introduction tout à l'heure, et puis de nouvelles associations qui ont souhaité investir cette politique publique. Nous avons des associations qui font uniquement du mentorat et d'autres qui proposent en fait toute une palette euh, d'actions en faveur des jeunes dont le mentorat est une des modalités. Et donc ce sur quoi nous nous sommes appuyés, c'est la grande diversité d'associations, mmh. aussi bien dans leur pratique que euh, dans les publics auxquels elles s'intéressent. Et donc c'est la force en quelque sorte de, de ce plan, c'est d'accompagner mmh. les associations qui sont euh, très diverses. Et puis dernier point, euh, c'est le caractère interministériel de cette politique. On l'a voulu porter avec l'ensemble des ministères concernés, l'ensemble de nos collègues des autres départements, par exemple euh, l'administration qui porte euh, les politiques en faveur des, des territoires ultramarins pour le développement euh, du mentorat sur ces territoires euh, et des jeunes qui en ont besoin sur ces territoires, l'administration en charge de l'enseignement scolaire ou de l'enseignement supérieur, euh, et là aussi une forte implication de, de nos collègues ou de, des questions sociales autour des jeunes euh, de l'aide sociale euh, à l'enfance. Et donc euh, ça a conduit à donner une grande visibilité euh, au mentorat en France qui d'ailleurs a obtenu, c'est l'ancienne première ministre Elisabeth Borne qui a fait en 2023 du mentorat la grande cause nationale, ce qui a aussi contribué à de la visibilité, et en particulier médiatique, autour de, de cette question du mentorat. Et donc, on, mmh. on, nous étions vraiment euh, dans euh, ce qui rejoint d'ailleurs l'intitulé donné à cette conférence, cette volonté d'aller plus loin, de toucher plus de jeunes, et en particulier les jeunes les plus éloignés. Merci beaucoup. So, from 30,000 to 105,000 uh, youth uh, mentored uh, in France in less than three years. Thank you. Christina, you are, so now I'm switching to English. <laughs> Christina, you are uh, the Director General at Actiris, the employment agency in the Brussels capital region. What are the reasons behind the decision of your region 
to support and implement mentoring as a public policy tool? Okay. First of all, I thank you for the invitation and I'm very glad to be here today with you. Uh, my English is not so fluent, just I'm sorry for that. Uh, first of all, uh, 10 years ago, uh, we launched the first social impact bond contract mm. in association with COIS Invest. At that time, mentoring was, uh, was not established in Belgium and there was not a solid uh, studies of evaluation about the effectiveness of mentoring. Despite that, activists and the government, we decided to launch an innovative model with mentoring and especially for the young people and uh, job seekers uh, with particularly at the um, migrant background. Thus, we try with Duo for a Job, and I think they are in the uh, they today. Are, they are. <laughs> uh, Duo for a Job uh, for a three years uh, test for uh, a lot of job seekers in Brussels. And we are very, very um, proud of the mm. results. Mm. During the three days of the test, 322 duo were created and 133 uh, jobs found. But the most important for us was the evaluation. Mm. We do an intern evaluation and also a counterfactual evaluation with an independent uh, uh, organization and uh, we are very impressed by the results in fact the um, <coughs> excuse me the mentorship with uh, duo for a job with uh, very important in about the employment rate mm. the employment rate was uh, 28 percent higher than the control group and with that result we are continue to develop mentoring in Brussels. So a direct impact? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. We will come back to the results and the, the impact all these policies had uh, on our youth. <coughs> Stefan, I'm turning now to you. Uh, inside the European Commission, there are 33 Directorate Generals, and you are Deputy Director General for one of them, Employment, Social Affairs and Inclusion. And your role as member and director of the European Commission of the uh, DG employee, your role is to support and inform policy making these policies as well with scientific evidence. And you propose new laws, manage EU policies and allocate EU funding. So this is, uh, this is why we, we think it's really important to ask you um, when you hear your member states uh, present these national and regional policies around mentoring for social inclusion, how do you see uh, the GG employee role in supporting this development from your perspective? Thank you very much and, and very nice to be here, very positive energy uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to see such momentum. Um, so. Of course, uh, the European perspective on social policy is is a, a, a more of a supportive perspective. As we hear here, it's the it's the member state, it's the it's the region or 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 the city that does uh, the real work. But the EU uh, and therefore also the European Commission has a very important role to play. Mm. Uh, to sum up, the social side of the EU. Uh, the heads of state and government has, has set three targets uh, that, that are our guidance uh, for how we work. Uh, we should have at least 78% of, of youth in, in employment. We should have at least 60% of adults in training every year. And the, the target is to lift uh, 15 million out of poverty or risk of poverty. Mm. All of this at 2030. And when we look at how we can support member states to, to do this, um, uh, then we, we have many tools. And I think this, I mean, mentoring and, and what we're discussing here is an important element, as we've just heard, of how to do this, uh, as how to do this in practice. 
And, and that is, has been very clearly recognized at EU level. Mm. We did, uh, we proposed a recommendation to the member states uh, a few years ago, and that was adopted around one year ago uh, on uh, uh, minimum income active inclusion, where uh, mentoring uh, figures as one of the explicit tools uh, for inclusion, uh, both in terms of, of uh, supporting uh, excluded groups through uh, minimum income and uh, also essential services, but also in terms of activation uh, into, uh, into uh, the labor market and also in link to, for example, support to uh, groups with specific needs. Mm. Um, so, and, and here uh, we see mentoring as, as really a, a, a key tool. Obviously, it's, it's going to be something like we've just heard here that, that, that uh, each um, authority, each country chooses how the, themselves how to use. But I think it, it's very important that we uh, help uh, from, from this type of event, from successful policies, to show that, that mentorship is really, a, a mentoring is really a tool that works. I saw in your, um, uh, in your uh, what's it called, the position paper, mm. uh, for example, this, this uh, statement of the evaluation, I think it was of the German program, of, yes, of uh, one euro invested is, yes. is eight euro. Malou and Du yeah. report, yes. So, so I think those type of, of uh, facts are going to be very important. And I saw it myself, and I, I'll, I'll stop there, but I saw it myself when we had this big crisis after the financial crisis in 2008, and we had these uh, enormous youth unemployment figures with 50% of the uh, youth unemployed in some countries like Spain, that, that mm -hmm. this type of reaching out of active support is absolutely crucial. So, I mean, we see it, and that's why I wanted to come here today. We see mm. it as a very important tool that we would like to support further in terms of reaching out to decision makers across EU to youth. Mm, thank you. And uh, this is why we, we want to move forward in the discussion and, and talk about implementation. And it's really interesting because here we have, we had three uh, programs, uh, three countries represented. Now we have two, but uh, Spain also had a very similar implementation with uh, um, mentoring, entering policy uh, for uh, integration of newcomers. But uh, let's discuss with uh, you, Thibault, first. So I'm going to switch again uh, to French uh, because I'm, we're curious about how we make this possible, how we work uh, together with organizations, with different, you were saying, different ministries. Uh, it's not easy. So, dès le début, pour construire justement cette, cette politique publique, vous avez décidé de travailler avec les associations, avec plus de 60 associations qui participent aujourd'hui au, au plan Agenda Mentor. Pourquoi ce choix de vouloir travailler justement avec le tissu associatif Vous parliez de diversité. Qu'est-ce que justement tout ça a permis Alors, euh, tout à fait. Il faut bien être conscient que pour nous, c'était la construction d'une nouvelle politique publique. On est vraiment sur euh, la construction de quelque chose de nouveau. Il y avait plusieurs possibilités. Effectivement, la, la volonté a été dès l'origine de travailler avec les associations. Elles étaient, alors effectivement, elles sont aujourd'hui une soixantaine, plus d'une soixantaine dans, dans le collectif Mentora, mais à l'origine, elles étaient 6-7 mmh. euh, réunies et euh, la volonté de faire euh, du bottom-up, c'est-à-dire mmh. qu'on avait un certain nombre de, de, de pratiques sur le terrain sur, sur lesquelles on a souhaité euh, s'appuyer. Effectivement, l'enjeu le, pour nous dans nos politiques publiques sur la jeunesse en général, c'est de véritablement toucher les jeunes sur le terrain. Et là, on a un véritable savoir-faire des associations euh, sur les territoires qui connaissent les jeunes, qui savent euh, s'adapter, qui ont euh, chacune des savoir-faire un peu différents en fonction du public auquel elles se destinent. Et donc, c'est sur ce savoir-faire qu'on a voulu s'appuyer et c'est ce pourquoi on a construit la politique euh, en lien direct avec les associations. Notre volonté, elle a été de travailler au travers d'appels à projets. Hein, comme je le disais tout à l'heure, on dispose de 30 millions d'euros euh, euh, par an pour euh, la politique, euh, de manière à laisser les associations proposer les actions euh, et la nature des actions qu'elles euh, pouvaient porter dans le cadre de ce plan 
euh, mentorat en France. Et donc, c'était important pour mmh. nous en, en termes de, en termes de, de méthode. Et puis, euh, effectivement, tout ça en lien avec le collectif Mentora, donc collectif qui rassemble euh, les associations euh, qui euh, agissent dans le cadre de, de ce plan et euh, qui avait pour vocation, et qui est d'ailleurs euh, réussi, de fédérer, attirer de, de nouvelles associations dans cette dynamique. Et euh, c'est ça qui a permis de porter l'essor mmh. qu'on évoquait tout à l'heure. Et donc, je tiens vraiment à saluer les associations, mais aussi l'action du, du collectif Mentorat, de son président Christophe Paris, parce que c'est aussi ce qui a rendu possible la montée en charge que j'évoquais tout à l'heure. Et depuis l'administration, en fait, notre rôle a surtout été un rôle de suivi, d'accompagnement, et puis, il se poursuit aujourd'hui, de mobilisation des différents départements ministériels qui sont concernés par cette politique. Et justement, on parlait d'impact. Euh, comment est-ce qu'on s'assure que tout cela fonctionne, au final Alors, euh, c'est une vraie question, évidemment. <rire> Quand on, on, on travaille avec euh, des, des fonds publics, c'est extrêmement important pour nous. Et donc, euh, il y a plusieurs dispositions. Déjà, il y a la question du, du, sui, du suivi. Hein. Depuis l'administration, on a des échanges réguliers avec le collectif et avec l'ensemble euh, mmh. des associations qui sont concernées. D'ailleurs, on va renforcer encore euh, nos équipes euh, en termes de moyens pour assurer euh, ce suivi. Et puis, il y a la dimension euh, plus euh, euh, scientifique du suivi. Une des chances euh, de mon administration en France, quand je discute avec les directeurs de la jeunesse d'autres pays en Europe, c'est qu'on a la chance d'avoir au sein de notre administration un service indépendant scientifiquement qui s'appelle l'INJEP, l'Institut National de la Jeunesse et de l'Éducation Populaire, qui réalise des statistiques, des évaluations, des recherches. Et donc, j'ai souhaité qu'il soit chargé d'une évaluation de la politique du mentorat. Et donc, il a mis en place euh, un travail euh, avec un certain nombre de, 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 de chercheurs. Hein. On a un comité scientifique, on a des chercheurs étrangers, d'ailleurs certains sont, sont représentés ici, qui travaillent avec cet institut. Je voulais le mentionner, on a une revue de littérature internationale mmh. qui a été publiée, qui est en ligne, alors je crois à ce stade malheureusement seulement en français, mais que vous pouvez trouver, et puis des évaluations qui sont mises à disposition de tous, y compris des associations que vous pouvez retrouver mmh. euh, directement en ligne. Par ailleurs, on a un certain nombre d'associations qui elles-mêmes ont travaillé à des mesures d'impact, et c'est extrêmement utile pour nous quand on négocie les budgets, quand on cherche à montrer, et vous le savez, euh, que les euros investis dans cette politique, ils ont un vrai sens pour les jeunes. Et puis, le collectif Mentora a lui aussi joué un rôle important en menant euh, une étude avec l'agence phare qui a permis mmh. aussi de, de caractériser, d'évaluer, de, euh, de suivre et, et encore une fois, d'améliorer les pratiques pour accompagner encore mieux euh, nos jeunes dans le cadre de cette politique publique. Merci. Ça s'annonce pérenne, alors. <rire> uh, now I'm switching to English. Uh, and for you, Christina, uh, I'm going to continue on, on the outcomes and, and the results because this is what matters. We work for having an impact on, on youth. Um, my first question is, what have been the outcomes uh, for you and, and your organization of this, this choice of including mentoring in your organization? After the uh, test, Mm -hmm. During three years, uh, we decided to put um, in place a five-year framework, financial mm -hmm. framework, the mentoring convention. Mm -hmm. And uh, this convention uh, allowed us to finance three uh, organizations, mm -hmm. a duo for a job and new one, mm -hmm. and uh, to finance the project but not only also uh, for the young people, but also for other mm. uh, job seekers. Uh, for example, job seeker with a low uh, background qualification and also for the job seeker, long-term job seeker. Mm. Because we think that the mentoring is also an uh, experience, not only for young, but for the other. Yes. And it's very important for us to have an idea of the impact also about this uh, public. Um, the mentoring in Brussels um, had um, attracted the attention of the other two regions in mm. Belgium, uh, Wallonia and Flanders, and now they also launch a lot of uh, experience. 
uh, to support the mentoring, because it's a very uh, nice uh, news for mm. uh, Belgium in general. Um, now we are um, at the end of the new five years, and uh, we are also evaluate again mm. uh, to know uh, how we can do better. And also we are uh, introduced in the FSE, en social européen mm. plus, the mentoring we use in our uh, program operationnel. But it was very important for you and also in the use guarantee. Mm. You, it's a, how to say that in English, it's a someone coherent use guarantee mentor for you. It's very mm -hmm. important for us. Mm -hmm. And um, one of very important thing for us is the average employment rate is about 63, 65 persons. The people, young people and older uh, were mentor have a very, very big uh, chance to find a job thanks to the mentors. And it's very important. But also, we don't have uh, to um, forget the other uh, rate, for example, to the um, education, the mm. studies, mm. Uh, the training, and also the internships. As the rate is about 77%. Uh, this is very high for Brussels uh, rate, and we are very uh, mm. impressed by these results. And the other important thing, and the, the person, uh, the key uh, is uh, important, is the, um, the improving of the social capital mm. of these people. And it's very, very important. Absolutely. Like Grace told, uh, told us before. Um, so we see in, in these two uh, policies, and also if uh, Anise was here, uh, I think she, she will share the, this, this idea that uh, evaluation is key. Um, that we need funds and structural and long-lasting funds also in order to uh, create a long-lasting policy. And then it's very interesting what you mentioned, the spreading of it. Uh, here we have a national um, uh, public policy, thanks also to Collective Montora and all the coordination. In your case, uh, you disseminated and you inspired uh, regions and, and, and countries. Um, and those, but those poli, po, public, uh, public policies are also very fragile because uh, policies are related also to political changes, to changing social context. So maybe a question to, to maybe the three, the three of you: How uh, we we can maintain this this policy, the pub this public policy effective? Like, how can we, as also organizations, can work with you, right, in order to, um, yeah deliver the promise to our youth and this is a open question to the three of you go ahead thibault in in french uh, je vais quand même répondre en français um, effectivement déjà le, le premier point c'est que nous on a obtenu dans notre budget annuel que ces 30 millions soient sanctuarisés on a même obtenu l'année dernière ce qu'on appelle le projet de loi de finances en France, qu'on ait 5 millions en plus qui y soient ajoutés. Et donc le fait que ce soit inscrit dans notre budget en tant que tel, évidemment ça peut toujours être remis en cause par des arbitrages politiques, mais ça assure une stabilité de la politique publique. Mmh. C'était important pour nous que ce soit inscrit en tant que tel, c'est une ligne dans notre budget, et donc on... l'argent reste là. Mmh. Mais, et je réinsiste, c'est la deuxième partie de votre question, c'est toutes les études d'impact, qu'elles soient menées depuis l'État, mais par les associations elles-mêmes, elles sont extrêmement importantes dans ces négociations budgétaires pour démontrer euh, l'utilité du mentorat. La vraie difficulté qu'on a, et cette fois c'est le, le chercheur, le sociologue qui va parler, c'est que vous le savez, c'est que les effets, ils sont à moyen long terme, ils sont diffus, ils sont sur les soft skills, mmh. donc on est sur des politiques où aussi l'impact, est, et on sait qu'il est là, on l'observe, mais scientifiquement il est compliqué euh, à, à mettre en lumière. Et donc, c'est quelque chose aussi qui est, mmh. qui est une difficulté pour nous dans les discussions avec les budgétaires. Si je peux continuer en français pour réagir. Oui. Euh, nous aussi, on a euh, la même politique, c'est-à-dire que les budgets sont inscrits. Et comme vous dites, tout va dépendre 
de décision pour nous à notre niveau suite aux élections qui vont avoir lieu en Belgique donc, euh, et à la région. Mm. Mais nous, en tant que service public d'emploi, on croit au projet. Donc, on montre via les résultats, via les évaluations, les études d'impact, via cette volonté de l'avoir inscrit dans le FSE+, aussi, cette volonté de le pérenniser. Mais nous, on est dans une situation où on pérennise de 4 à 5 ans. Mm. On n'a pas de baguette magique pour pouvoir dire ce qui va se passer. Et c'est vrai que c'est très difficile pour les, les associations. Mais déjà, si on arrive à pérenniser les financements sur 4-5 ans via des appels à projets, on travaille aussi comme ça. Ben voilà, ça nous permet de, de continuer notre travail, de, de convaincre le politique et, et euh, des biens fondés mmh. du dispositif. Mmh. To, to add finally, I think the European perspective is, is important here in the sense that, that we have these, uh, the, these guiding documents, uh, overarching policies, and they are not political, uh, mm. they, they, and they are long-term. And uh, in that sense, I think that, that helps also uh, when you underline the importance of, 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 of active inclusion ge generally, but also using uh, mentoring in this, in this context. Uh, then that, that shows that it's something that independent of the, of the, of the political colors and, and and changes, this is something that, that, that uh, we should invest on in the EU. And um, as, as you mentioned, the, the ESF, the European Social Fund, uh, is a very important tool here. Uh, so it, the European Social Fund has a, a budget of around 100 billion euros for, for seven years. And, um, and more funds go to the poorer countries uh, so there is more impact in in countries. Uh, uh, I mean, less I would say in France and, and 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 in Belgium than in Romania or Bulgaria. But in these countries that are poorer and that are building uh, and and dealing with some really serious social challenges, we also work closely with them to bring in the uh, experiences from and and for example. Uh, we have a very good cooperation between the public employment services. Uh, we're going to meet in a few weeks uh, in, in Liège. Um, and, um, and there we bring out these very good experiences uh, and, and, and to all the public employment services um, in the EU. And then we work directly with them to, to, to tell them, if you have this issue, of, of uh, for example, youth very far away from the labor market, we see that a tool like mentoring uh, really works. And then we can bring in the mm. example from Actirius, for example, to, to make that. And then that also gives that public authority a way to convince the political leadership to use it. So, so that, that's a bit from the EU perspective. But it builds, of course, coming back to mm. good evaluations and showing that this works. Um, and uh, and also showing that this works a bit independent of the of the specific context. Uh, it is just not because you have a specific model in Germany. It works in Germany. I mm. think you you can adapt it to the dis different national context. Thank you. Thank you to the three of you. Um, before opening the Q and A, that I hope you can start asking your questions on the Imagine app. We will take some questions um, later. Um, we would like to hear about the stories of mentors and mentees who have benefited from your policies and your efforts and the efforts of many people here in the room. So please, if we have the video ready, let's see it. Ilona, c'est une personne très motivée et qui souhaite absolument réussir son objectif d'alternance. Antoine, c'est quelqu'un sur qui je peux compter, qui est intéressé par mon projet professionnel. J'ai 19 ans, je suis en BTS profession immobilière à Subtercer et alternante chez Nexity. Je suis Antoine Protin, chef de marque chez Pernod Ricard. J'ai été mise en relation avec Antoine grâce à l'association Proxité. Ce que j'attendais de mon mentor, c'était de trouver une alternance rapidement. Donc il m'a aidé à corriger mon CV, ma lettre de motivation, il m'a coaché, il m'a mis en relation avec de nombreux professionnels de l'immobilier. 
Avec Ilona, nous essayons d'anticiper des sessions de travail ensemble, en général une semaine sur l'autre, et on va travailler pendant une heure sur un sujet en particulier. Au début, ça pouvait être donc se préparer à l'entretien. Aujourd'hui, c'est plutôt tourné autour de comment se présenter en anglais. Les avantages d'avoir un mentor, c'est qu'il m'accompagne tout au long de mon projet, avant et après mon objectif. Si j'ai un problème, je sais qu'il sera là pour m'écouter. Il va me donner de nombreux conseils qui me seront précieux pour mon avenir. On se sent soutenu. Ce qui me plaît particulièrement dans le fait de mentorer un plus jeune, c'est de recevoir de la part du jeune son point de vue sur mon métier, sur mon activité et de voir dans quelle mesure ça l'aide à construire son propre parcours professionnel. J'ai pu développer ma confiance en moi. Je sais que si j'ai un entretien, je vais être beaucoup plus à l'aise. Donc du coup, on sent qu'il y a un réel changement grâce à Antoine. Вече 5 години съм доброволец в организацията, като последните 2 години съм една от най-активните доброволки, като участвам в почти всяка една дейност. А, също така съм най-младия ментор в организацията. Преди година и половина а, аз станах голяма сестра на едно момиченце, което се казва Гери. А, нашата разлика е 10 години, но въпреки това, според мен, ние изградихме една много силна приятелска връзка и мога да кажа, че доколкото мога, съм им помагала с каквото, а, с каквото мога, а, както съм мислила, че ще бъде и добре и за нея и за мен. Бяхме в защитеното жилище при първата ми среща а, и аз бях много притеснена преди срещата. Не знаех какво да очаквам, дали тя ще ме приеме, дали ще иска да говори с мен изобщо. И в момента, в който стъпих в защитеното жилище, даже беше за първи път тогава, а, в момента, в който видях, тя дойде при мен, в копче се, почна да ме прегръща и аз бях точно така, усетих едно вълнение, за, нали, започвах нещо ново, което ми беше неясно, но в същото време усетих едно успокоение, защото а, тя просто ме предразположи, точно преди аз да се ме предразположила по някакъв начин. А, и точно тогава разбрах, че всичко ще бъде наред и че ще изградим някаква приятелска връзка с нея. It was a bumpy ride, but, <laughs> but she always uh, knew what was best for me. One, two, three. Ow. <laughs> I am from India and I am in Belgium since uh, almost four years. Living life here was a very big challenge for me because I was not that outspoken when, when I came here in Belgium. I think something pushed me forward and I, I needed that push which, which uh, Elizabeth gave me. In the beginning, she was studying her French, which was very, very positive, but that was taking a priority over uh, the work that we were supposed to do together. But I learned something very, very important. My agenda is not uh, Hamza's agenda, she has her agenda. I felt confident for you because uh, we went through a lot of uh, stuff together and um, you did a lot of the interview questions and I felt there was such a big change in you from the beginning of the uh, duo uh, when we finished. So I knew that you would get a job eventually, you know, in your time. I was just uh, on my laptops looking out for the jobs and uh, this was one such uh, job which I um, sent my resume to. The company was a pharmaceutical company. I waited for like uh, a, a week and then he mailed me saying I, I got through the interview and I'm uh, going to start immediately. I opened my Gmail, the first mail I was typing you mm -hmm. saying this is uh, my job and I, I can't imagine or is this really a, a dream come true that I know I've started working. I know we have developed something which is important, it's a special relationship and I would hope and I think I'm sure when I say this that we can still be friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad that I met her and my decision was, was right, perfectly right, <laughs> yeah.
Thank you. So, yeah, three stories. Uh, the first one was uh, from France. Uh, the second one fr was from the program uh, Mentor Your Future, an Erasmus Plus program uh, run by five organizations. We have several Erasmus Plus program on, on mentoring. And the third one was uh, from Belgium, from Duo. Um, I would like now to invite uh, a last speaker for final remarks. Please, Anne. Really, surely, can you join us, please? <laughs> You're a member of the European Committee of the Regions and have been advocating for mentoring for the past years. Uh, you were the driving force behind the report on mentoring, which was unanimously voted uh, by the European Committee of the Regions uh, last October. So you are an EU region representative. Just uh, how can this work of the national countries, the regions, come into Europe and have an impact? Merci. Bonjour à tous. Bonjour à toutes. Uh, je veux m'exprimer aussi en français. Je ne suis pas la seule, manifestement. Donc, à Bruxelles, si on parle anglais, on se fait disputer par la délégation française. Um, alors oui, comme vous l'avez dit, donc le, le rapport que j'ai rédigé pour, dans le cadre de mes missions au Comité des régions. Euh, donc a été voté en octobre dernier. Il répondait à plusieurs euh, ambitions. Euh, la première était euh, d'essayer de trouver comment mieux harmoniser entre les différents États membres les pratiques euh, du mentorat en s'inspirant bien évidemment au départ de ce qui avait été fait et réussi en France à travers le, le plan Un jeune, un mentor euh, dont Thibaut de Saint-Paul vous a parlé tout à l'heure et puis de fournir aussi une base d'appui à la Commission européenne pour le développement de, de pratiques, euh, parce que jusqu'à présent, il n'y a pas encore eu de, de décision prise de manière formelle au niveau de l'Union européenne. Et donc euh, j'ai mené pas mal de concertations. Je remercie vivement le collectif Mentora qui m'a beaucoup aidé sur le volant français, et euh, Mentoring Europe qui m'a énormément aidé aussi à mener des rencontres avec euh, différents partenaires euh, et associations européennes. Et bien sûr, j'ai aussi me suis beaucoup appuyée sur les rencontres euh, avec mes collègues du comité des régions qui regroupent donc euh, euh, plus de 300 élus de toutes les collectivités euh, territoriales européennes. Euh, donc ce, ce rapport a été voté, comme vous l'avez dit, à l'unanimité. Euh, et partout euh, on a été signalé, et quelle que soit la tendance politique d'ailleurs euh, de, mes, de mes collègues au comité des régions, euh, donc tous ont souligné les, les apports euh, que, euh, que, promet, que promeut le, le mentorat euh, sur leur territoire, que ce soit au niveau évidemment de l'insertion professionnelle, euh, de la lutte contre le décrochage scolaire, que ce soit à l'école ou à l'université, l'intégration des migrants, donner plus confiance aux femmes... Euh, et, puis, euh, et puis, ça a été partout souligné aussi, et, et ça rejoint un peu ce que vous disiez tous tout à l'heure, c'est que l'investissement financier euh, que les États, les régions, euh, l'Europe aussi, euh, même si euh, je reviendrai dessus, ce n'est pas assez encore à mes yeux, <rire> euh, c'est-à-dire que l'investissement euh, en monnaie par rapport aux résultats que, que produit le mentorat, est nettement supérieure à la plupart des politiques publiques que nous menons un peu partout euh, mmh. selon notre, nos responsabilités, notre, notre degré d'intervention. Et donc dans ce rapport, euh, il y a plusieurs recommandations qui ont été euh, écrites et votées euh, qui concernent à la fois les collectivités locales, les États et euh, l'Union européenne afin qu'on puisse avoir une véritable reconnaissance du rôle des mentors, euh, d'inciter les entreprises, mais aussi les collectivités, qu'elles soient publiques ou, les, ou les, évidemment les entreprises privées, à mettre en place du mentorat. Et, euh, et également, euh, j'ai appelé à euh, ce qui est une sorte de label de qualité au niveau européen, puisque pour que partout où euh, le mentorat est développé, les, les mentorés puissent avoir la garantie d'un mentorat de qualité, quel que soit l'endroit où il est pratiqué en, en Union européenne. Mmh. Et j'ai bien sûr appelé aussi à l'accroissement des financements européens. Parce qu'aujourd'hui, euh, le mentorat reste encore trop fragmenté euh, au sein de l'Union, alors que nous sommes euh, euh, confrontés à des défis euh, importants en termes d'inégalité sociale, 
de cohésion territoriale. Et je vais me permettre une petite parole politique, puisque je suis une élue. Nous sommes à la veille d'élections européennes majeures. Merci. Nous avons euh, des adversaires qui veulent euh, abîmer l'Europe, je trouve. Euh, mmh. je, parle, je vais le dire clairement, hein, il s'agit de l'extrême droite hein, qui, qui menace partout, que ce soit en France, en Italie, en Espagne, et en Allemagne, partout. Et euh, je pense que le mentorat n'est évidemment pas la réponse, bien sûr, mais je pense qu'en termes de, de cohésion et de lutte contre les inégalités, c'est vraiment quelque chose qu'il ne faut pas négliger, parce que pour répondre à la colère des gens, je pense qu'on a besoin d'aider davantage les gens et de les aider mieux. Voilà, c'était une petite... Et donc euh, aujourd'hui, il est nécessaire, comme je disais, de, de, de soutenir davantage les, les associations et les organisations qui œuvrent dans le domaine du, du mentorat. Euh, C'est euh, organiser des campagnes de sensibilisation, euh, encourager les échanges de bonnes pratiques et euh, renforcer euh, l'utilisation des fonds européens euh, pour qu'il y ait une pratique donc, plus homogène au niveau de, de l'Union européenne. Et euh, je voulais dire quelque chose par rapport au FSE+, qui est évidemment un outil euh, que les collectivités et les associations peuvent utiliser pour financer des programmes de mentorat ou des échanges de bonnes pratiques, etc. Sauf que dans la réalité, nous savons, nous, euh, qui sommes en charge de, de l'utilisation aussi de, des fonds européens sur nos territoires, à quel point le FSE+, et en particulier peut-être dans les pays d'Europe de l'Ouest, qui, qui en ont moins, parce qu'on est plus riche, euh, mais dans des collectivités comme la mienne, parce que moi je suis élue dans les Bouches-du-Rhône, où on a un des quartiers les plus pauvres d'Europe, à Marseille, où euh, on a une pauvreté infantile importante, où on a des bénéficiaires du RSA, le RSA c'est le revenu minimum d'insertion en France, euh, l'intégralité du FSE+, est déjà dépensée à destination de ces publics-là. Donc on n'a plus de fonds disponibles pour financer avec ce FSE+, le mentorat. C'est pour ça que j'appelle à peut-être un jour un fonds dédié à ça, mais ça c'est un rêve peut-être, je ne sais pas, mais rêvons ensemble cet après-midi. Mais voilà, il faut que je pense la Commission se rende compte des difficultés qu'on a déjà et qu'il y a aussi des difficultés euh, pratico-pratiques que que dénoncent aussi certaines associations sur la complexité des dossiers européens. Et ça, ce n'est pas que pour le mentorat, mais également euh, qu'on a aussi des choses aussi stupides et basiques que, par exemple, l'anonymisation des dossiers, euh, qui, est, qui, nous, est une nécessité quand il s'agit notamment de mineurs. On n'a pas le droit de donner le nom des enfants bénéficiaires des fonds. Or, la Commission nous demande de mmh. nommer les bénéficiaires. Donc mmh. on ne peut pas répondre à des appels à projets mmh. qui concernent des mineurs mmh. pour cette raison-là. On a le même problème avec les femmes battues, hein, mmh. donc c'est exactement mmh. le même problème. Donc voilà, il y a des petites choses quand même qui demandent, à mon avis, pas un effort énorme de la Commission, mais qui, qui pourraient aider davantage. Donc ce que, je, ce que je voudrais maintenant, dans un avenir prochain, faire... Euh, et je, je, je compte sur vous, Thibault de Saint-Paul, vous m'avez déjà aidé, je pense que vous m'aiderez encore, c'est que je pense que maintenant la, 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 la balle est dans le camp des politiques, des ministres, de nos présidents, de nos premiers ministres, parce qu'il faut qu'on puisse, au niveau politique, pousser davantage au niveau européen, au niveau du Conseil, au niveau de la Commission, bien entendu aussi, pour qu'on puisse enfin euh, créer cette communauté européenne du mentorat. Et c'est à ce à quoi je vais continuer de m'employer. Euh, nous sommes à la fin d'un mandat au niveau du Parlement et au niveau de, de la Commission. Mais je compte bien, à partir de la rentrée prochaine, remonter au créneau pour que nous puissions ensemble y arriver. Je pense que le mentorat et tous les jeunes et l'avenir de l'Europe en dépendent. Merci. Merci. Merci pour ces paroles engagées. Merci beaucoup. Let's open now the, the Q&A. Um, again, we will have the... For today, we will be nice and have microphones and, and the app, but tomorrow, it's going to be the app. <laughs>
So, Fiona, I think we have one question in the app to kick off the Q&A. Do you have it? Yes, you, yes, okay, I yeah. do have it. <laughs> and let's prepare some questions in the room. Uh, it's a question in French from Philippe Bismuth. I'm going to translate it. And it's still uh, about um, the work between organizations and, um, and policy making and how can we um, work better together in order to avoid uh, derive, in order to avoid fallouts uh, from the original idea of the mentoring and in order to um, look at the quality without, and the quantity without forgetting the, quant the quality. Of, of what we do. I think this is, and this is the main topic of this summit as well. We will have a, a masterclass about it. So yes, how, when, also when we are an organization, I think Philippe is what you were saying, if not take the microphone and correct me, but yeah, how can we balance these two? It's going to be a plenary tomorrow as well on that. I think maybe this is a question more for organizations that also can answer, but if you want to have any any thoughts? Euh, yes, au niveau d'Actiris, donc on va lancer un futur appel à projet. Et par exemple, dans cet appel à projet, on va euh, intégrer les standards de qualité qui ont été développés entre autres en France et en Espagne. Donc justement pour assurer cette qualité. Euh, une fois que nous avons euh, sélectionné les candidats, on organise un comité d'accompagnement. Donc l'idée est vraiment que les organisations avec lesquelles on travaille nous remontent les difficultés potentielles qu'elles peuvent rencontrer. Bah, par exemple, un exemple très concret chez nous, nos agences n'orientent pas suffisamment de mmh. public vers les associations. Pourquoi Parce qu'on a beaucoup de partenariats, mmh. il y a une, un problème de lisibilité, et donc on va y travailler mmh. avec les organisations pour justement améliorer. Donc chaque organisation va venir avec ses méthodologies, mais nous, c'est important d'avoir un cadre commun mmh. et euh, bien définir les résultats et les réalisations que nous attendons. Voilà. Oui. Bien sûr. Euh, Thibault, et après Effectivement, c'est une question importante, et d'autant plus quand on est dans le, le cadre d'une montée à l'échelle telle qu'on l'a portée dans notre, mmh. dans notre exemple français, parce que par nature, on a effectivement une tension entre ces indicateurs quantitatifs cette montée en charge, et puis l'objectif de qualité fort est d'aller chercher les jeunes qui en ont le plus besoin. Et donc, ça demande une très grande de vigilance pour euh, s'assurer qu'effectivement, dans cette euh, volonté quantitative de, de toucher beaucoup de jeunes, on ne perde pas de vue l'enjeu d'aller chercher ceux qui sont parfois les plus difficiles euh, à accompagner mmh. à, sur le long terme euh, pour que ce soit efficace. Et donc, c'est quelque chose qu'on travaille, nous, étroitement avec les associations, ça demande du suivi, ça demande la mise en place de reporting, aussi d'indicateurs pour essayer ensemble de, de conduire la politique et de ne pas perdre de vue mmh. ces objectifs-là. Et puis, un travail aussi important qui a été mené bah, de part et d'autre. Hein, et chez nous, le, le collectif Mentora a aussi porté fortement avec les associations un travail autour d'un de, de, label, de ce qu'est un, un mentorat de, de qualité qui nous sert de, de golden standard aussi euh, pour porter la politique mmh. et pas perdre de vue ces enjeux-là. Mmh. Anne Je, je, je l'ai dit tout à l'heure euh, rapidement peut-être, mais c'est vrai que dans, dans le rapport euh, au comité des régions à destination de la commission, il est, il est il effectivement expressément demandé de mettre en place un label et un cadre qui soit le même au niveau européen, parce qu'effectivement, si on veut d'une part garantir aux bénéficiaires un mentorat de qualité, et, et on, on s'aperçoit que le mentorat ne fait que grandir, donc ça me paraît indispensable, et d'autre part, si on veut être pris au sérieux effectivement par la Commission, il faut d'autant plus pouvoir prouver qu'il y a un travail de qualité qui est fait. Mm. Stéphane, vous voulez réagir à ça I, I know, I think, I, I don't know, I'm here to learn about uh, mentoring. If we look at the European issues uh, and, and the more technical discussion, I mean, there's a risk that we get too technical, uh, but uh, when it comes to uh, how to spend uh, public money, it, it is definitely, uh, a com it de it's definitely very complicated because there's a lot of scrutiny and uh, Often it is taken by non-EU-positive 
resources uh, if, if something is spent wrong. So, so there is, a, I think, perhaps an over uh, zealousness uh, mm. in terms of, of making sure that, that, that everything is spent right and there is no fraud. Mm. Uh, so th this is a challenge because it is very, very heavy to spend EU money overall, not only on, on, on mentoring, but, but I think we, we're, trying to find, uh, we're trying to find ways out of that. And one, uh, one of these uh, ways that we're working on and that we have applied in some areas it is something that's very technical. It's called simplified cost options. But it is that you, you stop talking about actual expense, but you, you set up standard. Mm. And then you don't need to give the names. You, you, uh, and we also have a, uh, a new way of funding uh, that came after the pandemic. Uh, in the uh, called the resilience and recovery funding, which is most focused on 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 re big reforms. So let's say that France, uh, as we are here, wants to do a big reform in inc of, of of its system and introduce mentoring. Then the the money is tied to actually that reform, not to the actual expense. So I think that EU funding is going more and more in the way of of bigger. Um, uh, indicators if you want so but that's something of course that's very interesting that you discuss here and and also see and and as as has been done by by the committee to give ideas and push because in the end this becomes uh, as you said very well a, a very much a political issue mm -hmm. uh, so so uh, but I, I think here your work and knowledge can feed in very well to to help creating for example, a kind of a standard mentoring package for a local authority mm. uh, that, that can be a type of a, a model that then can be used and, and you can attach money to that rather than to talk about every single expense. So a standard mentoring package. We have uh, our homeworks <laughs> after this panel. <laughs> Thank you, Stefan. Uh, is there one question? Yes, I'm going to only take one question. Sorry, we are running out of time. Moi, je, juste deux minutes. En fait, euh, bonjour. Donc, je suis présidente fondatrice de l'association Codico. Je voulais rebondir un peu sur ce qu'avait dit euh, Anne, je crois. Excusez-moi, j'utilise votre nom. En fait, euh, voilà, vous, vous mentionnez que effectivement, on est, on a un enjeu. Là, on a l'aube des, des élections européennes et, et les, les extrêmes nous font peur. Et je voudrais simplement en fait, euh, souligner que je pense qu'au contraire, le mentorat, vous disiez que ce n'était pas un outil, mais pour moi, c'est un outil puissant pour aller à l'encontre de ces extrêmes, puisque euh, le, le premier argument est la, la fermeture des frontières et puis euh, euh, minimiser au, au maximum euh, les, 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 les vagues d'immigration. Et moi, je pense que le mentorat, notamment le mentorat des personnes, des, des primo-arrivants qu'on a beaucoup mentionnés, finalement permet une rencontre. Et quand on parle de rencontre, on n'a pas beaucoup insisté aujourd'hui, mais en fait, le mentorat, c'est quand même un enrichissement mutuel. C'est quand même quelque chose qui, qui permet aux deux parties de, de changer de regard, de, de s'enrichir. Et donc, le mentorat, notamment de primo-arrivants, de jeunes primo-arrivants, permet finalement un changement de regard, permet aussi un changement de regard des mentors. Et petit à petit, finalement, indirectement, plus de cohésion dans les entreprises, dans le pays. Donc, pour moi, c'est un outil puissant. Et puis, euh, accessoirement, je vous mentionnerai que enfin, mon association est financée par des fonds européens, non pas le FSE+, mais le FAMI, effectivement, qui est parce qu'on est sur un public particulier. Voilà, merci. Euh, bah écoutez, je, 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 je suis entièrement d'accord avec tout ce que vous venez de dire. Tout à l'heure, j'ai dit que ce n'était pas la réponse, parce que je pense que c'est un problème complexe, la montée de, des extrêmes. Mais je pense que, c'est ce que j'ai dit tout à l'heure, le, le mentorat est une des réponses, effectivement. Et euh, concernant euh, l'intégration euh, des primo-arrivants, euh, nous avons euh, bah, l'excellentissime euh, association du haut for a job qui fait un travail remarquable en Belgique, mais aussi en France et 
euh, en Espagne. En Espagne, voilà, pardon, j'avais un trou de mémoire. Et puis, en nous langue. avons aussi un défi, euh, là, je vais parler d'un exemple franco-français, excusez-moi, mais on a une, euh, nous sommes en charge, nous, les collectivités locales, euh, de recueillir et d'aider les enfants, ce qu'on appelle l'aide sociale à l'enfance. Ce sont les enfants qui sont retirés à leur famille pour tout un tas de raisons. Et sont intégrés à l'aide sociale à l'enfance euh, les enfants, euh, ce qu'on appelle des, les mineurs non accompagnés, euh, donc qui sont des migrants mineurs et euh, qui représentent plus d'un tiers des enfants que nous, dont nous avons la charge. Et euh, il y a une loi qui s'appelle la loi Taquet, dont un décret est entré en, en vigueur au mois de février euh, dernier, qui euh, oblige les collectivités locales à proposer du mentorat à ces enfants et donc aussi à ces enfants non accompagnés, aux mineurs non accompagnés. Et nous allons nous appuyer sur des associations euh, qui œuvrent déjà spécifiquement pour les mineurs non accompagnés en leur à travers le mentorat, notamment une association qui s'appelle Les Ombres. Je ne sais pas si elle a des représentants oui, qui y sont en a. là aujourd'hui. Et voilà. Mais tout ça, ce sont des, des, des défis supplémentaires et des coûts aussi supplémentaires pour les collectivités parce que l'État nous a <rire> transmis cette mission, mais nous n'avons pas de fonds supplémentaires. Donc <rire> voilà, on est toujours un peu coincé à devoir choisir euh, auprès de qui on va intervenir. Et c'est, est-ce qu'on va plutôt aider des femmes victimes de violences conjugales ou des mineurs non accompagnés ou des bénéficiaires du RSA C'est voilà, les choix auxquels, en, en, en tant qu'élu aujourd'hui, on est tous confrontés parce qu'on a une enveloppe qui est contrainte, bien sûr. Euh, L'argent ne tombe pas du ciel, il n'y a pas d'argent magique. Mais il y a quand même de plus en plus de choses qui, 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 qui demandent des ajustements et, et peut-être un redéploiement de certaines mmh. politiques européennes. Mmh. Merci Anne. Malheureusement, on doit s'arrêter là. We have, to, we, have, long, we have to stop here, even if we could keep talking. Um, so thank you very much to the four of you. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be talking about uh, newcomers and uh, mentoring for newcomers on tomorrow's plenary afternoon. So we will keep on talking about this topic. Yeah, so thank you. Um, to close the first plenary Absolutely. session, we have a very special guest all the way from the United States. Can I get a big applause for Jermaine Myrie? Thank you for our last speaker. Thank you. Here, you want a microphone? Yeah. So Jermaine is the uh, joint mentor in 2023 as the organization CEO. And Mentor is the biggest, uh, the first and the biggest umbrella organization in the US for mentoring. So please, Jermaine, uh, take the floor. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so I joined Mentor one year ago today. So this is my one year anniversary. I, uh, I want to say that we have, uh, many years ago, someone once said that we have just a minute, 60 seconds in it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but must give account if we lose it. Only 60 seconds, but eternity is in it. I think about that because when we talk about mentoring, we are talking about giving of ourselves. We're talking about giving time, small time, large time, any time. And I'm excited to say that this is an exciting time for mentoring. Across the globe, the moment is now for us to invest our time. Invest our time in newcomers, to invest our time in neighbors, to invest our time in the young, and to invest our time in the old. I was heartened by the video from Belgium with, with Hamza and Elizabeth talking about her journey in Belgium and, and getting there from India and spending four years. And Elizabeth said, well, you know, she had a different priority than my priority. And what I want to say is that we often talk about mentoring as something for young people, and we miss the important point that sometimes it's mentoring for all people. That the young, the old, the rich, and the poor. Last, uh, a couple moments ago, there was a question about 
privilege and what is there about research around mentoring for, for the interpretation I have in, in my English here is that of privilege. And, and I would say that Grace did a great job of talking about social capital. But I want to refocus us onto what social compact we have for our neighbors. That in all of our society, all 28 countries, right? 28? Is it 28? 23 countries here today. 23. I added five more. So they're going to they're walk through the door, I promise you. Uh, they're going to walk through the door. 23 countries that each of our countries, in some way, have said to us at some different point that we need to come together for something. Whether it was good or whether it was bad, there's this idea, idea of community and unity. And I'm excited to be here in Paris with you all to say, coming from the United States, that we are unified with you in, in talking about and sharing the gospel of mentoring. The idea that if we lean in and we, we commit politically, socially, economically to supporting each other, to providing caring relationships for each other, that we can break through loneliness, we can break through isolation, we can break through belonging, not for the six-year-old, the eight-year-old, the 16, or the 24-year-old, but we can break through for the 60 and the 65, the 70 and the 75-year-old. We can do that. We have the tools, and over the next two days, two and a half days, you're going to venture through some exciting workshops that the team has put together here at Mentor Europe that I, sh I am, am so energized by. Because I join you not just as a partner, but as a listener and as a learner, because while we have been 35 years at Mentor National in the United States doing this work, what I can appreciate is that we don't have all the answers. We need to still learn alongside each of you to figure out how to solve this puzzle this puzzle of how to bring people together, how to bring care and, and appreciation, how to bring joy, happiness, how to also introduce humility into conversations and relationships that can further people in their work, further them in their communities, further them in their family journeys. So I say to you, what are you going to do with your 60 seconds? I want to charge each of you over the next couple of days to imagine just one minute of your life. What will you do with that minute to ensure that this mentoring movement when you leave here is better than it is today? And also commit that there is a partner across the Atlantic and United States willing to listen, learn alongside you, share. I know I have a lot of my American friends and colleagues here, researchers, some of my team members at, at, at Mentor National are here to do the same thing. We're going to talk a lot, but we also want to listen a lot. And so I'm thankful for this opportunity, uh, Fiona and the team here at Mentor Europe, Sylvia for the invitation. Um, she wasn't sure I was going to come when she asked me to do this over almost a year ago, um, but I was able to put my pennies together. Uh, and, and, and make it happen. And here at the fifth edition uh, Mentor Summit uh, here in, Euro uh, in Europe, and we're excited at Mentor National. We're going to be launching the fifth edition of the Elements of Effective Practice. You saw Mike, Mike Garinger's face uh, put up on the screen. He's one of my team members. Um, we're excited about that to share with you all uh, around this, this work because this work is important. Uh, and it's important to you because you're here sitting in this auditorium for two hours without water or, or a restroom. <laughs> and um, so it must be important. <laughs> and, and so I will close uh, by saying this. Mentoring is a light. It is the light onto a journey for those people who are creating their own pathway. No one is asking for a hand uh, just to ask for a hand. But they're asking for you to give them direction down the road, um, <laughs> if I say light, will it point back? <laughs> Was it only me or I realized I've been interrogated there for a moment? Like, what's going on? Uh, but mentoring is a light, don't do that, uh, for folks on a journey down a pathway. And so use your time, and we're going to use our time to offer that light and guidance and support. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having me. It's a joy to be with you all and have a wonderful conference.
Thank you very much, Thank Jimmy. You. Thank you. So can I use my 60 seconds to book you for a mentoring session on public speaking? <laughs> because I was blown away. Wow. Thank you very much for sharing. <laughs> Thank you, Jermaine. I saw so many people taping and like filming you. So you're going to be on socials. <laughs> <laughs> so people, uh, that brings us to the... This is the end for today. Yes, yes. At least for the plenary. But what we, do we have? We have some uh, uh, last remarks. Um, we now have a 45 minutes uh, coffee break, or actually minus eight minutes. So 40 minutes. Uh, 40, let's say let's 40, say 40, minutes. Yeah, let's 40 minutes 40. coffee break. And then uh, we will go to our master classes. And afterwards, uh, at seven, we will see you for our uh, networking uh, cocktail soiree exactly. uh, for those who have chosen the option. Um, if you don't remember which master class you signed up for, uh, you can check the app, the Imaginia app, or you can scan the QR code on your name tag or you can ask one of the volunteers. And if you need assistance, please feel free to reach out to any of the crew. They will be wearing black shirts. Exactly. With the orange. staff will be guiding you through the rooms in case you get lost, because we are in a university. So you will be entering again in university experience mode. So, and for tomorrow, Fiona? And tomorrow, we'll be gathering here in the same place at 9 AM for the morning plenary. Uh, we'll be offering coffee from eight till nine, we'll have coffee and croissant. So please remember also to return your translation devices. Uh, we will give it back tomorrow again to you. And I have to say like, enjoy your first evening in Paris, the city of lights. And Jermaine. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.